So we we talked about this a little bit last week. We are in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus uh, teaching, and it's a collection of teachings that Matthew uh, puts together. But what Jesus is doing in his Sermon on the Mount is he is revealing God's view of the law. He is revealing a a God perspective on the law that he gave uh, many, many years previously to Moses and that had been observed and and tweaked and added to and interpreted uh, throughout the generations. And when Jesus reveals God's view on the law... Not only is it uh, refreshing, and not only is it different, but, but the Jews, the people that he was speaking to initially, first century Jews, and particularly the Pharisees, who kind of uh, held the role of interpreting and living out the scriptures, they would have been uh, shocked and offended by what Jesus was saying. In fact, Jesus comes along and 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 calls into question uh, the Jewish people's entire understanding of the law of God. A a law that that they thought they knew inside and out. They had it memorized. They felt that they understood it to the nth degree. But in fact, the first century Jews, particularly the Pharisees, were very much at home with God's law. They were very much at home with it. They were very comfortable with it. They had tamed it. They had tamed it to a a degree that, that sure, obedience to the law required effort, and you could argue significant effort, but what they had done is made it manageable. And Jesus, in essence, tells them that they have that all wrong. And so we're going to bump back to last week. We're going to uh, read the verse that, that actually leads into the verses that we read today, verse 20, where Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so even in this verse, Jesus is warning the people that he is speaking to that there is a shock coming, and it is going to be a radical shock. In essence, what he does there in verse 20, he he holds up the most morally sound and righteous people that you know. And he says, you know what? The most morally sound and righteous people you know, you look at their lives and look at their behavior, and I'll tell you something. You have to be better than that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, as I mentioned last week, the Pharisees and the scribes, the teachers of the law, these were the superheroes of the faith in the first century. But as I hinted at it already, this was the problem. They had taken God's law and they had overlaid it with traditions and interpretations and they reduced it to manageable size so that by careful external observance they could actually in their minds fulfill God's law. So they focused all of their energies and all of their thoughts into this outward obedience to the law and what did they neglect? They neglected their inward being their innermost parts they neglected their hearts and in so doing they had missed the forest for the trees they were living under an illusion one that if not repented from was going to lead to their destruction which is precisely why jesus came verse 17 the verse that we started with last week jesus says do not think that i have come to abolish the law and the prophets I have come, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so then, six times from that point in this chapter, Jesus overturns the Pharisees' familiar and comfortable ways that they had been interpreting the law, and we're going to talk about the first one this morning, that command not to murder, what does it mean? 
Well, in verse 21, Jesus sets it up. And this is a formula that's going to, to follow through the rest of the chapter when he talks about these different subjects. He says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. So that's the command as it was understood. It's the command that had been given. In verse 22, though, Jesus redefines it. He properly interprets it. He says, But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. And so, yeah, Jesus, Jesus extends the command, and he broadens the command, he deepens the command. But before we talk about that, maybe we should ask the question, what was wrong with the original command? Was there anything wrong with it? I mean, do not murder. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's clear. It's, it's easy to understand. Jesus says, you know what? If you understand it that way, by the letter of the law, you're not getting what I want you to get. And so here, Jesus is revealing God's heart and his mind on the matter. Jesus says, it's so much more than that. It's so much more than just not spilling blood. I mean, if we hold to the strict letter of the law and interpretation, and we interpret it as solely a prohibition to physically kill, Jesus says that we have actually weakened and we've debased the law. We're not seeing the forest for the trees. Because taken literally... Taken literally, without uh, working out its implications, without seeing or trying to see what is behind that commandment, it means that if we haven't physically killed someone, I can say, I am totally clean. I am completely innocent. There's, there's no wrestling with the commands. There's no working out of implications. I've made it external. I've made it visible to all of you. You can see that I have not killed anyone today. I've made it measurable, and I am completely in the clear. But brothers and sisters, Jesus tells us that that is not how God sees it. It's not that simple. Yes, there is an external obedience. There is an external obedience that's Hey, that's important. It's important not to do these acts that God forbids. But what really matters, what really is going to give us traction in terms of our relationship with God, which is what the law is all about, traction with God and traction with each other, uh, redeeming relationships, living in the way that God calls us to live, it's got to be an internal thing. Paul actually says this, the same thing when he's talking about himself in Philippians chapter 3. When he's talking about his external adherence to God's law and God's statutes and God's regulations, he says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Faultless. That's who Paul believed himself to be before Jesus showed him the light. See, if we get to define righteousness, if it's up to us to define righteousness, then we are going to define righteousness in such a way that it is, maybe it's hard for us, but at least it's manageable for us. At least it's something that we'll be able to achieve. But here's the thing. We don't get to define righteousness. Uh, That's not our place to define righteousness because God is the uh, the author of righteousness and God is sovereign. The law was actually given in order to reveal this. And Jesus has the same intention in these verses. And so, actually there are three ways, 
three ways in these short five verses that Jesus uh, extends and also deepens this command not to murder, where he shows his disciple, and by extension, he shows us what is this commandment all about, not just outside, but to our innermost depths. He extends and he broadens it in three ways, and the first way is this. Verse 22, but I tell you, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So Jesus takes this command not to murder, and he takes anger, and he puts them side by side and says, you know what? According to the law, this is one and the same. Murder and anger. And already... Already we should be on the edge of our seats. Already we should be getting a little bit uncomfortable. Jesus actually is tracing murder back to that secret place in the heart where the thought process that leads to murder actually begins. And so what Jesus is saying is that murder is not just a crime of the hands. Murder is a crime of the heart. And if you allow yourself to persist in anger, you have in essence, giving yourself permission to be a serial killer. Anger with a brother or sister constitutes a breaking of the command not to murder. Now we see this. We see this perfectly illustrated in the first pages of our Bible. As a matter of fact, it's the event that's recorded immediately after the fall, the story of Cain and Abel. We've heard it, right? Genesis 4, verse 1 to 8. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And so Cain was very angry. He hadn't done anything externally yet. When God came to Cain, and verse 6, we pick it up, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now I'll preach on that story at some point. I I never have before. What's fascinating to me is that God calls Cain on his anger before his anger gets the best of him and he kills Abel. God calls Cain onto the carpet, and you know what? Cain willfully disregarded what God had to say, what God had to say, because anger was more important to him, that he was going to exercise his anger and play that out the way he was going to play it out. That was more important. Anger, Jesus says is dangerous sin crouching at your door like a fierce cat tense to spring on prey that is how we should see anger and so this morning jesus looks straight into our hearts he looks straight into our hearts and says this is where god looks but not only that this is where god looks and this is where God judges. Not here, but here. You don't have to commit murder to have a murderous heart. Now, you might question that. I certainly do. I mean, when you put, when you put murder on par with anger, that just, that, in some ways, that doesn't make sense in my mind. After all, anger... Uh, Never standing by itself has killed anyone. Anger by itself doesn't take someone's life. Or, or does it? See, it's interesting here. And I, I don't know if I thought about this before, but when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and giving them these warnings, 
He's talking about murder, but he's not specifically pointing this at the potential murder victim here. He is pointing this at the potential murderer. Jesus, by saying this, is concerned with the murderer. He doesn't want the murderer to become a murderer through anger, and so he is giving a loving warning. He is giving loving instruction. And it caused me to think that perhaps, perhaps murder, whenever it happens, has more than one victim. So Jesus is talking to the murderer, and he is pointing right to the heart. He's saying it's not here, it's here. And that is confirmed by what the Old Testament says as well. We read this in Jeremiah 31, verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. It's also hinted at in Ezekiel 36, 26, where he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so Jesus is emphasizing we are not called simply to a mere obedience ex externally of the law. We are called to internalize God's law, to participate in that internalization that the Holy Spirit is placing and working in our hearts. And so as we seek to follow Jesus, it's not, about, it's not all about outward performance. It's about, it's about our inward heart and our quality of character from our inmost being. And so when it comes to anger, I've heard it said, and I think this is interesting, that we are as close to God as we are to the person that we like the least. We are as close to God as we are to the person that we like the least. We can't separate our anger from someone, our anger with someone from our relationship with Jesus. Now, I don't want you to get confused here because there is such a thing as righteous anger. God does get angry. The Bible tells us this. He gets angry when injustices are being perpetrated. He gets angry when, when people willfully stand against him. And we, when we are in alignment with him, have reason and have opportunity from time to time to share his righteous anger. So I just want to clarify something. There are two words in the Greek that refer to anger. And the one that is used here refers to a deep-seated and brooding anger. That's the, that's the definition I got from one commentary. It's anger that refuses to be pacified. Even in a situation like Cain, where God comes to him and calls him on the carpet, his anger refused to be pacified. It was also an anger that seeks revenge. It's a persistent anger and consuming anger. That is the kind of anger that Jesus is putting forth as being just as serious as murder. So, first point is this. In the eyes of the law, in God's view of the law, anger is just as terrible a sin, is just as sinful as murder. Here's the second way that Jesus broadens and deepens the commands he talks about our speech in verse 22b he says and again anyone who says to his brother raka is answerable to the sanhedrin anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell so jesus goes on to explain that angry words are as dangerous as angry feelings and they too constitute a breaking of the command do not murder now, in the past, I know I've run across this, different articles, uh, I've actually heard people defend the therapeutic use of angry words, that there is a, a therapeutic value to angry words, that, um, that somehow, uh, I guess, giving voice to your anger 
is a, a way to, to work through it in a productive way. It's a way to help us through our frustration and our, and our irritation. But Jesus here seems to disagree with that notion. He warns us of uh, unbridled spoken expressions of anger. And the two examples that he mentions are raka, which in essence means idiot, a word that I have to confess I have used in the past. But raka, what, what that is expressing is a contempt for someone's mind. It's calling into question uh, their sanity, okay? The second example mentioned is uh, you fool. Now, for us, those two probably uh, mean the same thing, but, but in the context of Scripture, you fool is, is a, a little bit different. It, it expresses contempt for a person's integrity or moral conduct, okay? So raka, in essence, is calling someone an idiot, and you fool is, is calling into question someone's uh, integrity and someone's character, someone's, someone's moral conduct. And so how, you might ask, does this constitute murder? Well, I would just say it's, it's character assassination at the very best. Common sense tells us that. But, but I want you to notice, too, the slippery slope that's introduced here with our language. Uh, when we call somebody an idiot or when we call somebody a fool, these are ways that we are dehumanizing other people, right? These are ways that we are, um, in our own minds and in our own perspectives, we are, are making people less than, calling into question their intellectual and their moral competency. And, you know, if we convince ourselves that someone uh, is less human or less than human, we can justify all kinds of things. We can justify hate, and we can justify uh, defamation. We can even justify murder. Because, hey, that person is less than human. They're an idiot. They're a fool. They're not anywhere close to where I am. And so, why do they need to be here? It happens all the time. I can point to... Numerous examples in history where this has been done on a large, large scale. This process of, of names leading to dehumanization, leading to horrible atrocities. It happens all the time. But Jesus tells us that hate speech, which is what I'm going to call it, even common socially acceptable words of contempt put us in danger of hell's fire. That's what he says here. And the word that Jesus uses to describe hell here is the word Gehenna, which uh, in the first century Jewish con conscious would have meant that place outside of the city where, where garbage is burned. It's constantly on fire. It's a place of refuse. It's a place of, of waste. And so what Jesus communicates here is crystal clear. Use words to treat someone like garbage, and you too will find yourself cast out and treated like garbage. Angry feelings, hate, and angry words are subject to God's judgment and have eternal consequences. Jesus is saying that to reject another person is a serious matter. It's a life and death matter, and it's a matter that certainly has implications for our relationship with God. If we say something cruel and destructive to or about someone else, that has to be brought to the Lord. It has to be confessed. It has to be repented of. Because once something is said, it's out there. Something significant has happened, and God has taken note of it. And only God can put it right. We can't just view it as water under the bridge because we are going to one day be held accountable for it. So this just gets more and more uncomfortable. And Jesus isn't even done yet. He's about to cut us even deeper. 
And this is probably the most fascinating thing I discovered this week. He's already said that you don't have to commit murder to have a murderous heart, and so anger equals murder. He's already said that careless words spoken in anger are subject to God's judgment, and so hate speech equals murder as well. Now he challenges us even further in verses 23 and 24. He says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave that gift right in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So I want you to look closely there because I hadn't before. What do we expect Jesus to say here? Well, we expect... That Jesus is going to say, if you remember that you have a problem with your brother or something against your brother, uh, you better go fix it. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says this, if you remember that your brother has something against you, then you go take care of it. Leave your your offering right there at the altar and go take care of it, even if it's someone else's problem. Now, that's shocking, isn't it? Verse 22 says, if you're angry with someone, get it sorted out. Verses 23 and 24 say, if someone is angry with you, get it sorted out. It's not good enough to sit back and wait for someone to initiate reconciliation. It's not, it's not um, okay to sit back and, and wait for someone else to make the first move. Even if it's their problem, it's our responsibility as followers of Jesus. And I would argue that that ties in with the Beatitudes of, of showing mercy and also the Beatitude of peacemaking. Jesus emphasizes this by the illustration he uses. He says, even if you are in the middle of a worship service, even if you're in the middle of a worship service like this, if you remember that somebody has something against you, get up and go take care of it. I'm just going to give you a second. Okay. But that's what he's saying. Even something as important as worship, go settle your debts, go reconcile before you even come into worship. Go and do whatever you can to make it right. Go take care of it. Seek to be reconciled immediately. And we see why in verses 25 and 26. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, he is using a, uh, a temporal example to illustrate an eternal truth here. And so this illustration carries a lot of weight. Jesus urges us to put things right quickly because the consequences could be terrible so ultimately what jesus is saying is that the sixth commandment do not murder has everything to do with the well-being of others and the well-being of ourselves as well the general negative precept of this command would be read something like this. Do nothing that would harm the well-being of yourself or others. Or put positively, it would be do everything in your power to promote the well-being of yourself and others. The basis of this command when it was first given was the very nature and character of God and the basis has been reinforced and proven and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We are to work constantly toward human well-being for ourselves and for everyone else. And that means no murder, of course, but it also means, it also means not to foster hatred. It also means not to to speak words of contempt. It also means to seek reconciliation in any situation, whether you are culpable or not, where there is tension and where there is strife. Jesus came to bring reconciliation to us. And he made the first and decisive move at the cross. 
sacrificing himself to redeem our relationship with God by actually being the victim of murder. How strange is that? But brothers and sisters, that is the gospel we have received by grace. That's the gospel that we are now called to embody, even as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit and guided by the Word. And so we take up our cross and we follow Jesus.